So, hello and welcome to Conscious Aging, Conscious Living, and also Conscious Dying, all together. Today, uh, we want to talk about death doesn't exist. And it's only interesting, this topic, why we are living. No? So, <laughs> I have invited Karen Voorhees, and she wants to talk about this topic. So, Karen, can you... Uh, introduce yourself a moment and then we dive into the topic, okay? Sure, thank you. I'm Karen Voorhees. Um, I have a PhD in cultural history, although I bailed out of academia as soon as I pin finished my PhD because I had started meditating when I was a doctorandin, uh, a candidate for a PhD, and I found what I was really looking for, which was a spiritual connection. So at that point, my passion for scholarship which had been the highest form of truth I could understand. I um, just kind of settled down and I said I had a passion for spiritual truth. So that was, gosh, a long, a long time ago. And I have uh, um, made my living by being a doctor's wife, basically, um, doing volunteer work, what I choose to do instead of what I had to do. A lot of it, uh, volunteer work for my spiritual organization. I'm an initiate of the spiritual path of Sant Mat, which is well known in India, although not outside. I meditate two to three hours a day. And uh, my, spiritual in my, my spiritual interest comes from personal experience on my spiritual path, as well as a large, if undisciplined, reading in the spiritual traditions of the world. Because when I took initiation in 1981 and discovered that there, is all, there are levels of truth way beyond the intellect, let me add it. But I was also wanting to know, is somebody trying to tell me the two plus two equals five? So I went on this passionate, widespread, undisciplined reading of the spiritual literature of the world. And now I have a great deal more life experience under my belt, including... Uh, helping care for seven dying elderly relatives. You know, Heidi and I have a, already spoken about that in another in another place in her conscious living form, caring for the aging and dying. So with that under my belt, I am musing on this topic that just popped into my head recently. Death doesn't exist. That's what it says in the Mahabharata, where the figure of God as they imagine it in Hindu religion, appears to Arjuna, the hero of the Bhagavad Gita, and tells him, death doesn't exist. And I think, what could that mean, really? What does it mean? Yeah, what, what do we mean when we talk about death, you know? Yeah, and what does it mean when a figure that is like, that's the equivalent of Jehovah, of our Father God, of the great Tao, of, of the great highest being we can imagine, Imagine in all the literatures of the world, if that equivalent appears to you and says, death doesn't exist. It's a boogeyman to frighten children. What could that possibly mean? So that's uh, kind of what, uh, this is a, I'm totally unprepared here, but that's what Heidi and I are uh, chewing into now. So Heidi, I'm going to turn this back on you and say, um, what arises in you when you hear somebody say, death doesn't exist? Do you just guffaw and say, oh, come on? No, no. I think there are several layers to that. Mm -hmm. I think the physical death as a person, as we know, the body, yes, the death exists. But death as a being, a whole being, you know, not only the body, but as the whole being, I do think that it doesn't exist. Or let's say... It's not as we think, you know, you, you know, I have had uh, plenty of death experiences lately. Yes. And um, especially with Mark, I always, not always, but often I have the feeling that he is still around in yeah. some way or other. You can say, okay, you are just, you know, uh, magical thinking and you have there are fantasies and whatever. Maybe, but maybe not. So um, normal science would say, oh, you are crazy. But can normal science prove that what I feel and what I intuit is wrong? Yeah. They yeah. can't. But I cannot prove that it's right. So we are at, at a path. So maybe yeah. 
it exists, maybe it's not existing. But only today I, I heard a, a German guy talking about this topic. And he said, up, we were talking about reincarnation, that up to 1800 something, uh, Schiller, Goethe, Hölderlin, they were still, it was a normal topic to discuss. And they said, how did he say, uh, humans are a soul incarnated in a, in a, in a body. And then the shift had, had happened, that they said the humans are bodies with a soul. <clears throat> so the, the priority has changed. And that since then, our materialistic uh, science is going with that. They are ignoring or, or refusing that there might be something else. You know, so, yeah. They cannot, they cannot tell me that it doesn't exist, even if they believe it. They believe like we believe, and their belief is not better than yeah. ours. So. Yeah. Yeah, this gets into um, Ken Wilber's four quadrants, where the material sciences are very much the upper right. That is what we can observe and objectively prove by empirical evidence. And it can neither prove nor disprove things that are in other quadrants. And yes, and it's interesting you brought up that point about Schiller and Goethe and so on. I was not aware of that, but it makes sense because historically, that's about the point where the Western cultures really got into the depths of material science, which is not, not that it was a mistake. Look at what we've achieved with it. And for many, in many ways, the world is a much better place. I mean, we, I'm sorry about vaccines, but you know, far fewer children, you know, almost every child born alive lives to grow up. Most of us live to old age and advanced old age. That was not normal before 1900 even. I mean, just the improvement in the material quality of life. So I am a fan of Western civilization, science, materialism, but there was that mindset that went with it that denied everything else. Exactly. And this this <laughs> colonialism of the left-hand yes. quadrants that they yes. denied that they exist. No? Yes. Because and that's what it will Go ahead. They couldn't measure the left-hand quadrants with the same means as the right-hand quadrants, you know? So, um, yeah, it's difficult. So, but anyway, I, I do believe even if they think that they have a, a good method and they have a good method, yes. but it depends on the axioms where they start yes. and how they start, this is a belief that this is right, you know? And then all the procedures may be right but if you start from a uh, wrong or a uh, dubious um, first uh, assumption, yeah. then, you know, it doesn't make it better, <laughs> even if all the calculations and all the procedures are right. So and there, there is this assumption among the mainstream scientific minds that, of course, consciousness is a byproduct of our brains. And for so many of them, that's an unexamined assumption, as you were just saying, mm. a starting point that you say, wait, let's examine this assumption. Yeah, and there are fortunately people who do. Yes. I mean, I, I don't know. If, I, I, I'm a fan of Rupert Sheldrake with his uh, mm. uh, research on, on everything, on the morphogenetic fields, on, on how animals uh, intuit that they're... Uh, that their owners come home. He has done a lot of work time mm -hmm. ago on, on, on um, telepathy and everything. You know, for me, telepathy is right. I did it with my cat so often, you know. I told her, ah. not with words. When I tell her with words, it's a problem. But when she's always doing this on my breast, no? And I tell her with thought words, stop it, lay down, put your hands like this, and she does. And this, yeah. not only once, but almost all the time. So for me, it is very clear that animals understand our thoughts, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, if science said that is my imagination, maybe, but uh, prove to me that it is, you know. You believe that it is my imagination. I believe that's true and it's my experience. So please tell me how I, is your proof uh, why it doesn't exist? And if you think it doesn't exist because it cannot exist, that's not an accepted, for me, an right. accepted answer. And that's the same thing with death, no? Yes. We say death exists. Yeah, we see dead bodies, yes. In this sense, Definitely. death exists. But in another sense, 
that that ends everything afterwards yeah. <laughs> you know, I was just, I was uh, rereading some of Jung recently. They've just put some of his late, in, the interviews late in his life up available on YouTube. So I've been able to watch him speaking some of the thing, words I'd only read before. It's really great to see, you know, his face, the animation in his face when he says some of these things. But some of the points he and his followers have made, um, just what you were saying, Heidi, yes, our bodies certainly die. There's no doubt about it. I mean, that is empirically the case. And uh, Jung commented once, I mean, when he, he, he analyzed so many dreams of so many people over all the decades of his practice as a psychiatrist. Um, and he said, the deep psyche, you know, that place in our personalities that our dreams come from, that our mythologies come from, that our deepest poetry comes from, that place in us certainly believes in the death of the physical body. And he gave an example of a dream where one of his patients was terminally ill and was deny completely in denial about it. And that patient had a really brutal dream that got in his face about your body is dying, mister. At the same time, and I've many dreams about this the deep our deep psyche does not believe in the death of us as personalities let alone as spirits or consciousness our deep psyche is convinced that we continue to exist and this he gave i've read so many examples and had a few but the example he gave that i love is another patient i think this was marie louise von franz actually a patient who again was terminally ill uh, and, and then I had an experience with my own father, <laughs> but I'll tell this because it's succinct. A patient who was terminally ill and was really grappling with this issue, what is death? I mean, she was really trying to face it, not, not deny it. And she had a dream of a simple dream. It was a windowsill and she was inside the lighted room and there was a candle in a candlestick on the inside of the window and outside, you know, it was the outside. It was kind of dark, but not gloomy. It was just unknown. And she had a dream that the candle was on the windowsill inside and it started guttering. It started flickering and guttering and starting to go out. The light on the candle started to go out. And then in the moment, the, the flame disappeared. The candlestick disappeared and reappeared on the other side of the window pane, just, just you know, two inches, a few inches away. And it was lit and it was burning brightly. It was on the other, uh, it was the same candle, but now it was on the other side of the window pane. That's and uh, yeah, and I think I may have told this dream when you interviewed me last spring. Um, but my father, when he was dying of, of cancer, um, he, and he was a materialist, my father was a nuclear physicist. Um, he was upper right quadrant absolutist. If you could not measure it in a laboratory, it did not exist. But during the last few weeks of his life, when he, what he, because he had lung cancer, he couldn't get enough oxygen to support the higher executive function. So he was speaking from that different level of his psyche. And everybody else said, oh, his mind's wandering. But because I'd had a lot of experience with Jung and so we were talking this mythological language. And I had the deepest, most meaningful conversations with my father during those couple of weeks. And in one of them, he, he'd been kind of dozing off. You know, he had, he had that oxygen cannula in his nose. He just kind of woke up. And I was sitting with him and he looked at me and he said, but, but how do I check out here and check in over there? And I, I knew what he was talking about, right? Because I'd been reading Jung and, had, and so on. I said, it's easy, Dad. It's the easiest thing you'll ever do. It's all automated. All you have to do is just let it happen. And it kind of went like that. And I knew from reading Freud, Jung and so on that when you have these conversations it's not over until the energy changes when the person goes kind of, ah, and he wasn't there. And then I thought, you know, but I know my father. And I said, well, dad, here's the thing. I mean, you are such, you are so good at making things happen. You're going to want to help make this happen. You're going to want to push the process along. This is going to be your challenge is you're going to have, your job is going to be just to accept and let it happen. That's going to be your challenge, but it will happen. It's automated. Don't worry about it. And that's when he went, ah, and then, and, and then he went back to sleep. So, so he didn't have to work for the, him. For yeah. himself. And then the other thing I was thinking when he's very much in the right hand quadrants, when you say automated, that sounds like technology and yes. that might have helped him. So it, yes. Just, yes. <laughs> yes. And I, 
and you know, now that you mentioned, I hadn't thought of it, but if there was another person, he was going to try to direct them because usually he was, I mean, he knew how to get things done. He was a good physicist and a good administrator. It's an unusual combination. Uh, he usually had a better idea than whoever he was working with. But if it's automated, well, that's, that's technology. Okay, let it happen. I can so, talk. Yes, in, in fact, and he had uh, my husband, we were, the whole family was present when he passed. I, I, to, I, I went into more detail about that in the other interview, but my husband, who's an, a retired MD, he's been the doctor who's pulled the plug and been present at many physical deaths. He said, my father's death was the best he'd ever seen. Oh, good. Yeah, it was very, it was beautiful, actually. We were all high for, there was an energy that filled the room. We were high. Uh, and anybody who's listening to this, if you want to hear the whole story, listen to the other interview, because <laughs> I've already told that story to Heidi. So, yes. But so far, so I, far, we're only talking about the personality. But the, to me, in my understanding, there's, there are even deeper levels than personality. Even the personality, according to the spiritual theories I have learned, the personality eventually dies too, but it's like a ripening and the deeper um, the deeper self comes forth. Uh, there, there's a self that goes way beyond personality, and that's the one that doesn't die. Okay, so let's let, let's start from there. The personality you develop it when you come into life, no? Uh, or do you already have it with your theory? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. How is that? Ooh, that's interesting. Complex and nuanced. Mm -hmm. um, and here we could get into the whole theory of karma, which I I pretty much have bought, although I think all of this, really all of this we're saying is just a map. Anything we say in words or think in concepts is a mental map. It's not the territory. So even though I have really assimilated and accepted the whole theory of karma as it's taught in India and elsewhere, I suspect that there is a deeper truth for which um, even our theories of karma, even if they're correct, are just the map. So we'll find out what the truth is when we get there, right? That's what we're exploring. But yes, according to the theory, there's, we, we come in with a certain karma, destiny karma, and that shapes our life, who we're born to, um, what kind of body we have, what race, uh, what, what socioeconomic level, what kind of education we're going to get, who our partners are in life, our friends, what kind of job we have. How many, all that's written, that, but that's like the seed, but yeah. then how we develop that, we have free will in how we deal with these as they come up in our life. And we build further on that, depending on how we deal with what comes up. So this, this can get very technical and complicated. So I'll yeah, stop there, there. There are other uh, ideas who say that you from the beginning choose, but who is that you? Choose oh, yes. where you want to be born. Uh, That's the question. <laughs> Which you are we talking about? Because exactly. in the spiritual theories that I've accepted and elaborated into my own internal map, we have many levels of who we think we are. And Ken Wilber goes into this brilliantly. I mean, he ties all this together. He's done our hard work for us in putting all the world's wisdom traditions together in all the quadrants, including the science and the economics and the culture, et cetera. And so there are many levels of you. And as you go up Ken Wilber's levels, we see that even once we get to being homo sapiens, there are how many levels? There are six levels in first tier, and then there are more levels beyond that. So we, uh, and, and as we, and this is what you were saying, Heidi, we develop ourselves, but at the, what's that phrase Wilbur quotes from Robert Keegan, the, um, subject at one stage becomes the object of the subject of the next stage. And I very much see that as we develop into a more mature level of who I feel myself to be. First, we are just bodies, you know, sensory motor. Those, these are Piaget's levels. And then we develop certain cognitive capacities that allow us to have a more complex and mature and sophisticated self-sense. Mm -hmm. And that we keep shedding that sense of who we are as immature. Is that what you were getting at? No, actually I was getting um, before. Who uh -huh. is that? I was uh, alluding to the soul probably, okay. uh, who is choosing their parents, his, her parents, and yes. if she or he comes as he or she, and uh -huh. where, and so on. There are theories who say we start and when we are still in the other realm that we choose who who 
who we want to be in the next incarnation. So we are with a reincarnation theory here too. No? So um, as I have understood it, that's not that the karma is pushing you. Maybe, yes, you, you take it with you, but you have a certain, certain free will even before this you no? to, to, to choose where to go instead of karma just pushing it, you somewhere into some place. And then when you are in this world, yes, then there are all these developmental uh, steps which we do. And this is relatively clear, no? I mean, nobody mm -hmm. can doubt that uh, children have to learn speak before they can do mathematics or something, you know? That's, uh, that right. there's a uh, certain sequence of developmental steps. I think uh, that should be understandable. I hope to everybody. everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that, that brings up, I, I've been following uh, my current my current spiritual teacher is Ishwar Puri. He's in, in the lineage of Sant Mat, and he tells delightful stories. And he tells one that gets to your point, Heidi, I think maybe at yet a level up. Um, in one of the minor, one of the lesser known spiritual writings, the um, uh, Anurag Sagar, it's told that um, when the transcendent first came into manifestation, basically first manifested souls as, as contradicting from being all one in the great transcendent. But all the souls were still part of the great ocean. We hadn't yet separated out as souls. We were still completely part of the one ocean of bliss, glory, knowledge, love, beauty, etc. all those wonderful transcendent things. Um, and then the creator, the creation uh, was proposed and the creator God, uh, this deathless boy in Hindu mythology, sort of put this proposal before the souls and said, which of you want to go out into this manifestation and have an adventure in manifestation? And of the souls that were kind of in the bosom, you know, still one with the great ocean, one out of 10 said, yes, yes, let's go have an adventure in manifestation. The other nine, 10 said, oh no, we're happy here. We're going to keep what we have. Um, so, but then of the, of the one out of 10 souls that agreed to go out and, and basically help manifest the manifestation, basically the souls were the driving force behind it. One out of 10 of those, basically one in a hundred said, wait, what if we decide we've had enough and we want to come back before the entire cycle of manifestation is over? We, 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 want, an, we want an option to leave if we decide we want to. And then the, the creator God said, for you, I will send a, a transcended master who will be able to initiate you and take you home out of the cycle if you choose. And so those of us who chose to take the Sant Mat initiation are those uh, one in a hundred souls that decided to go back. But the story is that the souls, they're the Hunt souls and the Bont souls, I forget which are which, but the ones that stayed and never went out into manifestation, the majority, are dancing in glory you know this is these are all just images right but then those of us who went out and then called for rescue and came back when we go back we dance and we dance even better than the ones who stayed and uh, as my my guru says it tells it and then the souls that never left say hey how come you're dancing better than we are and those of us who went back say hey <laughs> you don't realize how good you have it here <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> but Rilke, Rilke actually says something to that effect um, um, in what I, I love this poem. Um, Talbe die draußen blieb, also dem Talben schlug. You know, the dove that went outside of the dovecoat and stayed outside. And then when it finally comes back to the dovecoat to its home, it knows itself to be at home. And that's, I, I love that poem so much. I've memorized it in German. And the last verse goes, let's see, über dem nirgends ein schwanz sich das überall ach der geworfene ach der gewagte ball füllt er die hände nicht anders mit wiederkehr rein um sein heimgewicht ist er mehr it's like um, this oh over nothingness over the abyss uh the the transcendent arches itself i mean it's very hard to translate real because he's difficult even in german um Oh, the ball that we dared to throw. Doesn't it fill the hand differently on its return? 
in its innermost weight, it is more. There's more there. There's somehow our souls, when we go out, that we're more when we go back. And I actually ran this past my guru. I had a chance to say, I mean, yes, the, yes, we dance. Maybe we didn't. Those of us who went out into manifestation, maybe we are somehow more joyful when we're back in our true home of the soul, where we is pure consciousness. But um, I have a sense, and this is what the poet Rilke says, that somehow we've grown or more than we went, we return more than we went on. He said, yes, you're right. Now, I think probably my guru says, yes, you're right to everybody who asks him. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I'm yeah. no wiser than before, but there is something about the consciousness. That's what I keep coming back to. There's something about going through this whole thing we go through of feeling like we're these bodies, we're in these relationships we love, we lose. Somehow the consciousness grow, is grow. Somehow God is growing more God through our going up through these stages. We are increasing the total consciousness somehow. And so we go through this illusion of death, if it is an illusion, that somehow we grow from it. I was thinking you don't necessarily go to spirituality to have the truth of what you are saying, because if you really grow up in this world and you go out and see how other people uh, have different difficult lives, and then if you're right uh, in your reaction, that would be gratefulness that your life is it's so good, you know, you come, yes. come back and can dance better because you know what you have, you know. Yes. That would be the, the right way to, in my opinion, to, to deal with the world. While instead many of us um, don't want to see the misery of other people and complain about minimal things in their own lives and they have no idea how well they are already dancing. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and maybe they should be pushed out into, into real life. You know, I try to make a parallel to what you were saying, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God said, you know, it doesn't ask them, go, uh, go, who wants to go? But in our societies, we should send the young people, I don't know, to Africa someplace where the women have to carry water for, for hours or right. something to, to really be able to appreciate their Warm, warm water, their swimming pools and whatever, instead yeah. of complaining that something doesn't work, you know? <laughs> oh, I agree with you. Uh, and, and exactly, you don't have to go to spirituality, you just have to open your eyes a little bit. And I agree with you. I wish more of us, especially in the more developed world, were more aware just how good we have it in so many ways. Wow. But I, you know, what spirituality has done for me in my life is it's made me more able to be present with the people who are suffering, you know, not to just shut my eyes to the, the horrors that are going on in some other parts of the world, you know, Syria, and so on, Afghanistan, and what goes on at home, here in my own country, in our own communities, that it has, because I, my personality is grounded in a larger framework, I can take the emotional intensity of, of absorbing just how bad it is for how many people and accept, well, I don't understand why there has to be this much suffering. This is a whole other question. If God is all good and all powerful, why is there suffering yet? We're talking about that in the Monday forum with Charles Marx, or that's a whole different subject. But I have been able to be more open to that and not let it overwhelm me, <clears throat> excuse me, not feel like I have to go out and save the whole world that's a pretty heroic inflation, but God bless the people who are out there struggling to make things better. I support them. I find ways to support what I think is likely to work, and I make it part of my life and keep my life in balance, and I'm not overwhelmed by it because I have the sense of a larger self that's eternal, that can never was never born, can never die. At this point, I'm about as confident of my eternal existence as pure consciousness as i am conscious of as i am sure of anything else mm -hmm. that's what my and for that i'm very grateful yeah i do believe that i'm i'm not quite so sure about me but um i'm, I'm still uh, fig, trying to figure that out you know with uh, <laughs> you know spiritual practice whatever <clears throat> and also with learning more about this world and about humans, about human behavior, about human thinking and, and, and whatever. 
but I have the tendency to believe that there is some reason why I am here, why we are here. That is not just, um, you know, <laughs> by chance. Is it like a sense of dharma that your life has a purpose that you need to find what that purpose is? Yeah. Or is it larger? Are you talking it's about something larger? larger? It's, it's larger. It's anyway, it's larger. It's not only about me, you know. Uh -huh. I had an experience in, in June where I went to have for the first time in my life uh, magic mushrooms. And I had... Uh, I realized that, oh, what I saw there, I already sort of know that. It's only more colorful and it's more <laughs> explicit. It's more the separation of yourself and what you observe is more clear than in, in, in normal circumstances. And then I entered into a, a grieving process and mm. I gr noticed that I was grieving for Mark. Yeah. Yes. And, but I realized I was grieving for the whole world. Yeah. Wow. And this, I really felt that it was not only me, you know, or Mark or so. It was really more. And then uh, afterwards, I remember that once I had a, it's about 10 years ago or so, even longer, I had a session with a clairvoyant. And she said, you have the capacity to cry for the whole world. And when I felt that, really, you know, I was grieving and asking um, perdono, or what is it, uh, forgiveness mm -hmm. and, 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 and grace, you know, that came out of, I had a sort of such a move, movement, continuous rhythm wow. movement and was crying all the time. And so, but I was at the same time very observing you know i had all these emotions and 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 i i could observe them and that was maybe the difference between normal meditative states which i had seen so far and 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 that induced one but why do i say that uh i i've lost a i have um, a question but, when yeah, you're done i have a question it's it's about uh if we continue to live if we are dying and uh I had the feeling that yes, Mark is dead, but he is not dead. You know what? A, it's I, 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 I sort of feel the energy, and I feel that more often. No, not only <clears throat> there, but there it was more clear that uh, that I that I still have him around in some way, and this process helped me to finally come into my energy again, to finally. <sighs> We, you know, I was so pushed down and in sort of depression and everything was difficult. Life was so difficult and so heavy and I didn't have... I, saw, I saw that in you in June. I yeah. saw the difference in June and then the difference before and after. And the Heidi from before June is back now. But the Heidi during June was a very different Heidi than the one I'd gotten to know. I could, I could see that. I could feel it and see it. Ah, oh, that's good. Yeah. No, I yeah. felt it for myself that there was something happening which I could let go of, uh, uh, of fear, of preoccupation, of doubt. I still have doubt on, on other things, you know, but it, that was a sort of a deep existential doubt which was sort of eating. You know, it was not a, a, a healthy way of doubting. It was uh, too... Too, I don't know, too negative, I would like to say, yeah. you know, yeah. too depressive. And this really had helped me to, to, to come out of it. And so I do believe that when you enter into deep meditation, which probably I never have in, in the same sense as you have, because I don't have such an intense uh, meditation practice, but I had a glimpse of it. And I do believe to have got the, the message that there is much more than in normal consciousness, you would think that exists. <laughs> no. Wow, yeah. yeah. And that would, that, that's, that's an area I would love to explore. But first, if you, if you feel to, when you were talking about the grief and the ability to grieve for the world, I'm really curious if you can put into words what was the essence of the grief, what was grievous, what was what what were you grieving about? What was the core of the grief? Um, 
I think the grief was the existential, let's say, desperation. Desperation. Yeah, that uh, our human existence is flawed, let's say. If it is death alone, I don't know. But altogether, what we are talking about violence, I've posted on Facebook lately uh, what I got a a private video uh, of huge violence in South Africa from people I got to know there, where one black person or several black person hit other black person on on, with a stone on the head. And I mean, it's not a, yeah, you can say racism, but I don't know. So uh, why are people doing this? You know, that's that's part of the grief I, I, I had, that we are in this stage that we mistreat each other in one way or, or other, or physically or psychologically or whatever. That was surely part of it. But it was also the the part that we have that we come and go and that we are like a flower, you know. I got wonderful flowers today. Yes, yes. <laughs> Blue flowers. They're uh, beautiful. Yeah, and that we also go and that um, that it doesn't matter in some way because we are still in some way, and this is the topic of today, we are still here some in some way and in a certain state of consciousness you can feel the connection with the rest of the universe let's say yes. it's, it always sounds like big words and strange <laughs> words, but when you live it in this moment it, it's very clear no yes yes so yeah it was yes good. and yes wow yeah this is deep stuff this is really deep stuff and and why are we going through? Why, why do we go through this? If we have this higher self and we're part of something so much greater, why do we have to go through these depths of of distress, despair, suffering, and so on? That I think that's that's still my you know actually now I have a guru story here. Well, let and me so- first remind you, Ken Wilber said if uh, uh, God was too alone uh, to play with himself, it's boring. So yeah. he, he said, uh, let's do the, um, create the universe and let have people, you know, to, as you said, make their experiences. Because otherwise, when you dance always in bliss, you know it from your own life. When it's everything beautiful, after a while you get bored. So yes. <laughs> you, you need something, some distraction or some different challenge to 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 go on and i think that's the main reason i mean that's also a belief but it makes sense to me (laughs) it does and i agree and that's kind of the gist of of uh, my spiritual tradition too basically god wanted an adventure i think i think of all of manifestation as god's fantasy role-playing game you know or movies enjoying a day at the movies however let's draw the line at hitting each other on the head with stones you know hey wait 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 let's 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 say let's learn from experience and said we don't want to do that anymore uh, there's 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 still a lot of work to do here, but I actually had the chance to ask my guru, the one who initiated me in 1983. I had a chance to ask him the big question, um, uh, and this was we were on tour. There he was Takar Singh. Yeah, anyone who's interested can can look him up in Wikipedia or something. Um, and there were only about 75 of us. He was uh, just hanging out with his initiates for an afternoon, technically answering questions, but he was hanging out with us. And somebody asked the question. Well, if God, if, if, if the transcendent is all bliss, all power, all glory and everything, why did he create this manifestation where there's so much sin and sorrow and suffering? And I thought, you know, I leaned forward and listened because I was only just out of graduate school and I did just basically spent the last two years reading the world's spiritual literature and none of the great world's teachers answered that question. The Buddha flat out refused to answer it when one of his disciples asked him. He said, you know, hey, hey. <laughs> just do your you grow up yourself and you see the answer for yourself um don't waste your time with theoretical questions so i'm listening what's the guru going to say well talker Singh, he got this dreamy look in his eyes and he looked up and said hmm, yes generally that is the first question we ask god when we meet him face to face on the fifth plane and i will translate like say eighth dimension mm-hmm. you know where manifestation comes from you know it's 
And so, and then he started looking around for the next question. And, you know, so I totally broke protocol. You're supposed to sit quietly and raise your hand and wait to be called on. So I went, mm. <laughs> kind of, his eyes kind of twinkled and he looked at me and said, yes. And I said, did you ask? And his eyes twinkled a little more and he said, mm, yes. And he started looking around for the next question. He was teasing me. He had a wicked sense of humor. So I went, mm. <laughs> and he called on me again. Yes. And I said, I literally went like this. May we know the answer to? So he leaned forward and looked me in the eyes. And this is the tradition in this spiritual path of you know, the eye to eye contact with the enlightened masters. You get, you know, you get the kind of side. So he looked at me and I looked, I leaned forward and I literally, I was fresh out of graduate school. I literally mentally turned on my inner tape recorder because I was really good at getting the lectures that the professors gave me. And I remember thinking, oh boy, I'm going to get every word of this. And he talked and 10 minutes later by the clock, I came back in my body. He took me out of my body. I wasn't in my body for the next 10 minutes. And the reason I know, the only reason I know is because I, when it came back 10 minutes later by the clock, there was like a 20th of a second when I was conscious half in and half out of my body. I was conscious of having been out and of coming back in and I was half in and half out. And it was like coming through a veil only it, none of this was in, uh, it was energy. It wasn't physical. It wasn't form. Um, and so the closest I can come to describing the veil was like a diffraction grating in physics, but it was like half of me was inside and half was out. He had taken me and shown me, but the memory of it was staying on the outside of the veil as my consciousness came back into my physical body. And so like for a 20th of a second, half of me knew and half of me didn't. I was aware of losing the memories I came back in. So as I landed back in my body, it was an energy thing, but I kind of did this kind of surge reaching through trying to pull back anything I could pull back in with me. And I kind of, and there was the thud you get like when you're dreaming and you suddenly wake up from your dream, thud, you're back in your body. And he was finishing his last sentence, the last phrase, and he was talking as usual and everybody's going, mm, yes. And now he's looking around for the next question. I didn't remember a single word, <laughs> even though he'd been talking, just talking. And so I kind of looked in my awareness to see, is there anything I brought back? And here's the answer <clears throat> I was able to bring back through the veil. It all had something to do with love. That's what I was left with. It all had something to do with love. So, okay. <laughs> I don't remember what he showed me, but, um, Okay. Oh, that's one of the number of adventures I've had. So, okay, so I'm kind of going, this is faith, but it's not blind faith. It's confidence that based on this and many other experiences that there is something so much bigger out there that who we really are is so much bigger than our bodies. It's so much bigger than our conscious personalities. It's so much bigger than our total personalities. It is pure consciousness. It is so vast. Our soul, and this is a conviction, I can't give reasons for it, but as soul, who we really are is soul, pure consciousness. Soul is so great that the galaxies are her necklace. And somehow we are all billions of individual souls and yet we're all one. And I don't understand that at all intellectually, but I have such, I mean, I believe that more than I believe the ground under my feet these days. So for that, I'm very grateful. And I don't get these experiences in meditation. Meditation is mostly just sitting there trying to refocus yeah. my attention. But, but then I get these other blessings of things that land on me. So I will say with great conviction, we are so great as pure consciousness. So what I wanted to ask you, when you uh, were away and then you could notice that you came back and then this moment you also noticed that you would lose it. So you probably have been in pure consciousness there and couldn't bring it over into this realm. And it reminds me with dreams. Yes. You know, when, when you are dreaming, you are aware that you are dreaming and really clear, that's very clear, uh, not, not 
always, but then at least I feel it. Then there is a moment of the transition. And if I catch it, then I can reconstruct it in some way or relive it. But if I don't, then I come back into normal consciousness. I know I have dreamt and it was very vivid, but I don't know it anymore. So if we can use dreams as metaph metaphor, Metaphor? Metaphora? How, I don't know in English. Metaphors, how. yeah. Metaphor, yeah. Uh, for what is happening when we transition in, in the other part of, of, of pure consciousness. Would you say that that's what it is? I mean, it's maybe not a one-to-one -one expression, but that it is sort of this journey which we are living every day. Yeah. Um, Definitely part of the journey, and I think it's far more than a metaphor. Um, in this is kind of translating my spiritual path about Ken Wilber. I mean, it all translates straight into how Ken Wilber <clears throat> has laid it out that to me, these physical bodies are the outermost vehicles of consciousness. They're like automobiles. You know, I get into my automobile, I turn on the ignition, I drive off somewhere. I come back from sleeping where my, you know, my astral body, and this gets into a whole lot of technical stuff, I think our dream bodies are more real than our physical bodies. There's a filter of consciousness. Excuse me. <clears throat> Let me back up a bit. We have a number of subtle bodies. And my metaphor for this is dimensions. Our physical bodies exist in three dimensions. Let's say our very subtle astral bodies exist in four dimensions. We have even subtler bodies. It's called in, in, in some traditions, subtle bodies, causal bodies, um, Every tradition has a term for this. And that exists in five dimensions. That's the dimension of thinking, by the way, of our rational mind. But then we have our, quote, soul body, six dimensions. We have a seven dimension body. And then in the eighth dimension, now this is all a metaphor, but it's a way of putting it into terms that our discursive rational into, intellect can map. We have a vehicle of consciousness in three dimensions, in four dimensions, our astral bodies, our dream bodies, in five dimensions, six, seven, eight, and at that point, I'm not, I mean, well, that's the metaphor. Now, to me, our dream bodies are, if anything, realer than our physical bodies. So when we park our bodies, like we park our cars, when we've gone, gone out, done our errands, come home, we park our cars, we leave them parked, we leave them. When we park our physical bodies and sleep every night, we, our astral bodies, uh, our consciousness goes into our next level up, four-dimensional body. And some of the ex we are able to bring a few but not many memories back through that filter of consciousness. And then we have an existence in five, six, seven, eight dimensions. We exist in all, consciously in all those dimensions all the time in my personal map of how this works. The consciousness is limited in our physical bodies by our physical brain and nervous system. It's like only a certain very tiny portion of our total consciousness is active in our physical bodies, even when we're awake in them. Our true existence is much faster, and Jung had a lot to say about some of this too. Um, well, all of the spiritual traditions do. But to me, our dream body, our astral body, is, if it is realer than our physical body. And when our physical body dies, all that means is like, okay, I'm not going to drive that car anymore, you know, that physical car, um, it's, I have no use for it anymore, or I'm going to get a better one, and I just never go back into that car again. But I'm still me in my home, living my life. When the, to me, when these physical bodies die, we're simply in the next level up, which we've been in all along. Eventually, the astral body dies too, and then, but we're still in our, our, we still have all those other bodies, and eventually, we drop all the bodies, and then we're one with the, the pure transcendent from which we came as pure consciousness anyway. So from that perspective, I have been living my life for a couple of decades now, and it's helped me be present for those seven elders I spoke to with you about in our recent interview. It helped me be present through some pretty brutal stuff and, and just sit there and not have to leave. I mean, my husband's mother spent the last six months of her life wailing and you know, I was able to sit there, hold her hand, and do my mantra. There was no place you could go in her house and not hear her wailing, and it was emotional, um, not physical. Um, so, so having this, so I can say I've kind of torture tested my convictions here, because I've been able to be present when other people were in great distress and not not have to bail out. 
because of my own distress. So whether I'm right or I'm delusional, it's actually served me very well. And I could be kidding myself. I don't think so, but I'm not afraid of my own death. It's actually kind of, it's kind of, kind of, kind of it's going to be a relief to be rid of all these limitations. Although, you know, I'm fond of my body. I try to take care of it. But um, this, when you start having a sense of a, when you start having even tiny glimpses of an experience of a much vaster existence, even as our individual selves, and of even vaster existences beyond that, it makes it possible to be present for one's own other people's suffering and one's own suffering in a way that I wasn't before. I can kind of face it instead of pushing it away and refusing to deal with it and having it just kind of coming at me from my shadow the rest of my life. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not easy, but I think <laughs> it's part of human growth. If we are able to not run away, yeah. but stay with it, stay yes. with it. And I yes. think this is what uh, uh, spiritual teaching basically is doing. It teaches you to stay with what is going on instead of running away, you know, and you have yeah. to practice it. I remember at the beginning, the first death I sort of saw, but only from distance was from my first husband. His, uh, it was not even his mother, but the second wife of his father. And I had known her and then we had understood that she has cancer. And I came into the uh, hospital, into the room, and I couldn't recognize her. Only when she had the glasses on, then I recognized her. Um, and I was stuck. I mean, I was 22 or 23 or something. And I, I didn't know what to say. I didn't really know. I, it was too overwhelming to me. And then my father died a few years later. And I decided, I made the conscious decision. I had the possibility, stay away, live in Berlin while he was in my hometown and pretend that nothing is going on and let them do there, or come back. And, and so I came back in the last four months. My mother was there all the time and I did turns with my sister. And I really had a very good um, relationship then with my father, which I never had before. It, it was because I realized that everybody else was only concerned with his well-being, if he has pain or not pain or whatever, with his physical well-being. But I was there and I could talk with him and I could have a, a soul connection. Yes. But this at the end, I, did, I wasn't there when he died. At the end, this made it then difficult for me to accept that he was dead. Ah. It took me a long time, about 20 years, until I really could say, okay, he's not just away and it's by chance that I don't see him, but he is dead. So that if I had been there when he died, uh, it would, be, would have been better. I came later, but I couldn't see him anymore. It was all closed already. So, And then later, the other deaths, I most of the time I was present or my mother, for instance, I was present and with Mark, I was present and with my, some of my cats, I was present. So yeah, really the, my pre preferred, my favorite cat, uh, he died um, five years ago mm. and he couldn't jump on the bed anymore. He was hanging and oh. I took him and he died in my, um, oh. but you know, this is so good to be there and yes. be part of it instead of like yesterday I heard uh, from the vet that the cat has died during the anesthesia and this is bad I went there immediately he was still warm and I brought him home but if you are present it's, it's still different but at least when the body is there and it's still you have the idea that the soul is around I put him here near me and for half a day he was still at home so I have the feeling that at least in some way you can say goodbye to that, what I knew you were. Yes. And now let's see what else is coming up. And with Mark, I certainly, I don't know with the animals, I didn't have put much thought into that or much, um, how do you say, effort into, into feeling if they have come back in some way. Maybe they have in form of another animal. I don't know, uh -huh. the little one I have here. Uh, <laughs> 
But with Mark, I really have uh, the impression that he came back in many forms. You may think I'm crazy, but... No. Not at all. In the beginning, I think I told you that it was the crane, uh, which was every time there on our place near the river. And no, then, you, you haven't told me. Could you, could you tell the story? As soon as he was uh, dead, I went down to, to the river where we went often, very often. And uh, as soon as he was dead, there was a crane, a big bird like, like this uh, on the other side. And from then on... On the other side. On the other side. Always on the other side but further away on a tree. But 90% of the times that was there for the first six months, five months, and then it disappeared. And it didn't come back until about two or three weeks ago. I saw him again. I saw him twice or three times. But in the meantime, I had other uh, experiences. I was talking, uh, there was a friend who knew Mark only now about five, six weeks ago. And we were sitting down outside in our normal place where we sit all the time for eating. And I talked about Mark and she talked about, and at that point, a wonderful butterfly like this, big like this, came yes. in, uh, flew around us twice or three times, then stayed a little bit there and there. And, and I said to her, this is Mark, you know, and it never has happened a thing like this. But yeah. in this moment, when we were talking about him, he came. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you know, and in, I, I can see and hear him in many, in many expressions or uh, images of, of animals. And as he was very much in love with animals and mm, was okay. so, part okay. of our life, the cats, you know, and yes, the dogs. Yes. I, I do believe that he is choosing this way of being in communication. That would be the most natural way for him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Do you ever talk to, do you talk to him? Sometimes, yeah. And yeah. Uh, he doesn't talk, but I have sometimes the feeling, it's a very vague feeling, but, you know, I can also be inventing it myself, but I'm not worrying about that. I'm, yeah. I'm you know, uh, as I it's said good. before, you cannot, you cannot prove one thing and you can't prove the other thing. And if I have this feeling and it makes me happy or fulfilled, uh, then I think, okay, I take that as if it is, and maybe it is, you know, and so, yeah, I do believe that there is a sort of life after life, which after death, which is a different form of life, probably. Yes. It's in a different form, but it's still life. Yes. Yeah. But not life in the sense of, of breathing in, a, yeah. in, in physical lungs. It's, it's a yeah. different definition of life. Uh, that we don't need these physical, pardon? Existence is existence. maybe the best, better word than life. Yeah. We don't need physical bodies in order to exist. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's you know, the, Jung said something to the, to the, the point you just made about the sto these lovely stories you're telling, which, you know, whether they're true or you're imagining them, they are hygienic and positive and wonderful. So, okay. but Jung said in the end of the, uh, a free, an interview with John Freeman, which is available on YouTube, it's called Face to Face, Carl Jung. And at the end, he said he was talking about these, this very subject and the fact that we have these, so many of us have these experiences and that we are happier, healthier, we, our lives are better if we do believe or at least th think it possible that we exist outside these physical bodies, that it is good for us to think this way. And he said, it's like salt, you know, before we proved, before we had the science of nutrition, people ate salt because they wanted to, because our bodies do need some amount of salt. So of course we have a craving for it. And if we eat some salt, we feel simply feel better. Whether you can prove that it is objectively true or not, our lives are better if we behave this way. Um, so. No, we good should have some intuition and we should, you know what, after these experiences, I thought I would like to learn better to become more acute in my intuition, in my perception, which is not sensory perception necessarily, but right. the other sort of perception. Not yet sure how I can improve it instead of, uh, in, uh, instead, not instead, except of um, going into some stillness no, and, and listening. Then sometimes uh, I, it's like, like widening and then you get these um, mm -hmm. 
yeah, ideas. Of, I, I don't know how to. For to, me, I call them impressions, and I am an intuitive type on the Myers Briggs scale, which you know was invented by Jung. I am naturally an intuitive type, so it's natural for me to just kind of ask the question, sit quietly and then wait, and then an impression comes up, and it's not in words or images, but it comes through into an image, usually a, a visual image, and then I kind of unpack it symbolically. That's, mm -hmm. that's the way it works for me, and it's a very natural way to do it. That's good. I'm, I think I could do that too, but I still am often fighting with my mind who is telling me blah, 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 blah. blah. So Always. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm getting better in it. <laughs> so well, I... <laughs> I've qu I have a question, you know, I wanted to go back to your, your wonderful story about the cranes. I wasn't quite clear. So when you said when Mark, ha had you been sitting with Mark while he passed and then you went down to the stream and saw Not the crane? Not immediately, but the next few days, yes. But you were, you were present with Mark when he passed? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He was sort of in my arms, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that was, you know, and at a certain point there were two cranes mm. and, I thought, and they flew away. And I thought, now Mark is with his daughter. Yes, you yes. Know? And then I was also thinking his first love died also and his mother died in the period when we were together. So he had three uh, big deaths, three right. losses. Yeah. And I imagine that, you know, there might have been also this letting go. Now it's time for me to, to reach them. I don't know. These are all stories which we tell. Of course. Each, you know? But I was thinking, he, he was good in, in talking, you know, to the series with me and so on. But on the other hand, he was also, he didn't want really to, to make much effort uh, anymore. And uh, he just wanted to have calmness. And so, the, he reached the absolute calmness and it was some days before his death I said he said now I have always what I always wanted not to have to do anything and I said oh yeah what the price you are paying yeah. you know, so maybe maybe that was a sort of erroneous way of reaching what they wanted. I don't know if it's even <laughs> erroneous. Know. It's like, you know, we're all going to drop our bodies sooner or later. You know? yeah, no, what I meant with erroneous is he wanted to go into this state, but he obviously didn't find a different way but yeah. dying to, to get into this state. Maybe he could have found it also in life, you know, that's what oh. I'm thinking. Oh. I, I don't know. I don't know. It sounds, sounds like you'd have to be practically a Buddha. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, he was great. He he had to suffer a lot uh, of of pain at the end, unfortunately, because despite our good medicine, but the doctors are not really very much attentive. At least they were not here, and it takes all too long until you get the necessary help. And I was left uh, very much alone with deciding what to do and. Uh, there is no chance not to make a lot of errors and it, it really was weighing on me that of I couldn't alleviate the suffering as much. And I think he alleviated my, he alleviated my suffering by deciding oh. to, to go away before it was too bad, you know. Uh, so uh, 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 so oh. in some way he was a bodhisattva. <laughs> oh yes, but he, I think that he was alleviating his suffering as well as yours. Yes. Yes, as well as, yeah, both. both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that, 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 that aspect of it can be so brutal, and there's no question that drop, leaving the body can be a very brutal process. But, you know, sometimes the pain is not physical. Sometimes it's emotional. Yeah. And especially for people who have pushed away their, their, their yeah. deep yeah. Um, issues and problems and refuse to face them. And I went through this with one of the seven deaths I attended uh, where this gal, she had um, just basically refused to face her inner demons all her life. And she had some pretty, she was pretty difficult to be around. Uh, she had this, this perfect flawless surface. Everything must be perfect, perfect, perfect all the time. And that was basically her way of not facing her own her life. But then in the last six months of her life when she was bedridden and couldn't talk, 
And there she was alone with all this stuff that she hadn't been facing for 90 years. And we couldn't help her with it. She, she had a series of strokes and could no longer talk. And you know, we, we, we were able to alleviate her pain. I mean, there she, we, she had the best medical attention you can get. But we couldn't, I mean, and she was on a certain dose of antipsychotic and just not too much, but not too little. And so she got the best medical care you can get. Her suffering was emotional. And that was my job. I forget if I told you this story. Um, I was sitting there holding her hand one day, and I think I channeled her sister. I think her sister who had passed on channeled through me <laughs> to talk to her. Oh, my God, I'd never want to do yeah, that again. Like you, you tell, tell, tell. Yeah, but, but, but uh, and, and I want to come back to a point that we, we got to in our previous interview, because I think it's so important, and this is the spirituality of dying. How, whether you believe in spirit or life after life or not is our attention. And this is our, our consciousness because our attention is where we have the ability to choose where to put our awareness, our consciousness. That's our soul, if you want to define it. To me, it's a shorthand. Soul equals pure consciousness. That's probably too simplistic, but it's my shorthand. So wherever we're putting our attention, we are putting our soul's energy. This is the one thing we can always do for another human being. Yeah. If we cannot alleviate their pain or alleviate their suffering or solve their problems, if we can do nothing else for them, we can be there with our attention. And that is always the most precious thing we can do for another human being. And this is where in the West, we are such doers. I mean, we we have done so much in the material world that getting back to the point we started from, when there's nothing more material we can do for somebody, we can't stand it. We have to be doing something for them. And this is why so many people die alone or um, just they're, they're kind of left to go. They'll, people come and tend to their physical needs or material needs and then leave because we're so uncomfortable. Yes. When, we can, when there's nothing more we can do or say, we have to leave. We can't bear to be with it. This is where uh, a, a spirituality, a really grounded, embodied spirituality can help us and help everybody. Because if you can do nothing else, you can sit there and hold their hand if that's a helpful thing. You can sit there and be silent and do your mantra. You can sit there and just be present and, and give them the gift of your attention. That is always the most precious thing. Yeah, but that needs that you have come into a certain peace with yourself because yes. if you are fearing all that then you just run away you know yes. and that's for me it's a growth process and it's very 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 welcome that uh, I'm, I'm glad I did it and I know the decision was when I decided to be there for my father instead of pretending that I'm far away and don't have time to take yeah. care you know so yeah. that was yes the, so death doesn't exist. It does exist and it doesn't. It exists for our physical bodies, yes. but it doesn't exist for who we really are if we uh, take the track of going there, of trying to find out who we really are and discover, and it's a growth process. Yes. Uh, we are works in progress because as we discover our higher and higher selves, yeah. we realize that we just recycle at every level. Our physical body recycles on the material plane. Our astral bodies recycle on the astral plane. Our mental bodies recycle on the mental plane. Yeah. But who we, who we really are, who's never born and can never die. So yeah. that's, that's talking about us. Yeah. yeah, and talking about the people, our loved ones who have died, they are still with us in a certain yeah. way. And that's yeah. what I really... I really do believe, and I want to give encouragement to people who have to go through these experiences. Unfortunately, or <laughs> I don't know if unfortunately, but nobody can avoid it. That's just part of life. For, I don't think that any, anybody won't have any loss in their lives of, of somebody they knew or they were a friend of or so. So it's better to, to, to get somehow prepared and and learn to deal with it and use it as yes. also a source of wonder. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know, anybody who's had these experiences of the presence of somebody we've loved who's passed, you know, if you haven't had that experience, it's easiest to say, oh, poo poo, just wishful thinking. But once you start having these experiences, you know, they're real at some level. And so many of us have had them. 
So I, I, I want to echo I want to echo you, Heidi. Thank you so much for what you're doing, and I want to validate that too. That you are having this experience. Don't don't put yourself down for it. Open, no, and open, open to the wonder. That's it. We need to be open. If we say from the beginning, I don't believe that that doesn't exist, it won't happen. You won't have this experience. But if you allow and open the door a little bit, you can have this experience. And then if it's true or not, as you said before, we don't know. But if it gives us some sort of relief or happiness or something, why not? That's right. Why not use it? And why not feel the connection, you know, and maybe it's and, <laughs> and Yes, um, until a few hundred years ago, we had no idea that our bodies needed salt, but we knew we liked to eat it. We liked to have salt. We, we created trade routes like five, 10,000 years ago to salt. salt to regions that didn't have, because we like to eat salt. Now, only a few hundred years ago, we scientifically proved that our bodies need salt. Well, you know, we have not yet scientifically proved that our personalities survive our physical death, but we know we feel a lot better when we believe it, when we open ourselves to the experience, our lives go better when we are open to this possibility. So maybe maybe in the next century too, we will scientifically prove that it's oh, true. Yeah, I, I'm quite sure. Um... But this is a topic for another, uh, for another conversation about the Akashic fields and uh, which are scientifically proven, which something like the ground of being, but seen from a scientific uh, perspective. It's very exciting. So uh, the, the sciences, the inner and the outer sciences begin to yes. complement each other. And this yes. is so exciting. But let's let's stop here because otherwise we will talk for hours still and oh, we, we cannot could. overload our audience <laughs> <laughs> or ourselves and, and I have other things to do today too. So Karen, uh, you said you have the website up now. Can you say yes. where, uh, what it is? Yes, um, it's, uh, I will be sending out an announcement in a month or two and you'll get it. Um, yes, I'm writing a novel and I've also written some short pieces and I'm starting to go out as a public speaker and I am preparing a big launch of my website um, that'll roll out in a, I mean, it's up now, you can go and look on it. But uh, What is the address? Uh, it's my name and I'll, I'll, we're, we're working on that too. It's karenshearervorhees.com. I can email it to you. Yeah, uh, because I know it's it's tricky to spell. So we're working. I have a friend who's helping me with the technical stuff. Okay. But yes, this this will be this will go out. I'll be launching my blog finally in another month, I hope. And I'll be sending out an email announcement to you and to anybody else who's on my email list. So we can we can get all that straightened. The links on our websites then. <laughs> okay, good. So thank you very much that you have enriched uh, season six of conscious aging, which now I combine together with conscious living, conscious dying, which was a short season, uh, which I started last year after the death of Mark. But now I put them together because it seems living, uh, aging, living, dying, in some way, it belongs together. So <laughs> thank you very much and see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. This was fun.